<clears throat> which is a word that we hear a lot these days around psychedelics. And uh, I'll get into why. There are a couple of key notes that I'd like to leave you with this evening. One is to illustrate and invite us all into a memory and acknowledgement of elders, people that have taught us, people whose books or other influences in the world are part of who we are. Second is to give a very quick view, which I know will be incomplete, about why what is happening, this certificate program, why is it happening at CIS? And why is it happening now? Another note to leave you with is this is very clearly a work in progress. And I don't think we're out of the woods. There's plenty that could go wrong, and we would do well to be thinking about them. Uh, I'll give you some thoughts about things that could go wrong. It's not at all a complete list. I hope it becomes a topic of conversation over lunch tables and dinner tables. And right alongside it is, what can we do to mitigate those risks? So that's the general theme for the evening, this part of the evening. So these are some of the people who have been important teachers to me. Uh, a few of them I never met while they were alive, but their works have influenced me or their students have influenced me. Some of them are alive. One of them, Houston Smith, very close to the end of his life. And I won't go into details about them. The reason for doing this is twofold. One, to let you see where I'm coming from. And also, you can see the negative of this. You can see where the gaps are. Things I probably don't know very much about. Cultures I haven't been exposed to. Schools of thought I haven't been exposed to. And the second reason for doing this is I'm going to invite all of us to do a miniature version of this. And uh, here's the invitation. Somebody who would like to acknowledge a teacher or an elder or a mentor, um, when we get started, please raise your hand and I will point to you one at a time. And I invite you just to say the name. Nothing about them, just speak the name as Janice says in your outdoors voice so we can all hear. And anyone else who would like to is welcome to respond with presente. Uh, for our purposes, we can take as an interpretation of presente something like, we acknowledge the influence of that person in the room with us now. So there won't be room for time for everyone, but let's just get a good flavor of who has influenced everyone here in this room tonight. So hands, please. It's the easiest time to walk around. Adya Shanti. Presente. Presente. Brooke Zaporin. Presente. Janie French. Presente. Presente. Rick Goblin. Presente. Presente. Muktananda. Presente. Presente. Tony Robbins. Presente. Presente. Charlie Grove. Presente. 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 John Dado Lurie. Presente. Presente. Jim Wilson. Presente. Presente. Jim and Dorothy Fathom. Presente. Presente. Alexander Shogun. Presente. 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 John Gagnon. Presente. Mary Casamato. Presente. Presente. Vida Chaudhary. Presente. Isan Dorsey. Presente. Larry Brilliant. Presente. Maria Mangini. Presente. Richard Rockefeller. Presente. Stan Groff. Presente. Anna Donahue. Presente. Presente. Michael Midhurst. Presente. Bill Richards. Presente. Presente. Paul Stamets. Presente. Angela Saria. Presente. Thomas Kubo. Presente. If you have a name in mind and you haven't said it out loud, Let's just take a moment, uh, invite everyone to close our eyes, if you would, for a sec, and think of a name. Thank you. 
Thank you. I personally feel great doing this kind of exercise. Um, better? Good. Uh, it's very important to me. When I look at how I move through the world and what happens around me, most times it's not actually me. Most times it's the people whose, whose names have been put on the screen or have been said in the room. Um, there's something pleasantly humbling about that. So why is this program emerging at CIS? I'm going to give you a very quick, very incomplete history that will give you a flavor for why, in my estimation, it's actually inevitable. Where else would it possibly be happening? So around 1950, there formed an organization called the American Academy of Asian Studies, which in a while became the California Institute of Asian Studies. And there are at least two people in the certificate cohort now who were actually in school there, which then became the California Institute of Integral Studies. In that photograph, the person on the right is Alan Watts. There are two more pictures of him. Um, one is in a chaplain, I believe, as, as a chaplain, I believe, at Northwestern, um, and then at CIS. And his statement is that the American Academy of Asian Studies was one of the principal roots of what later came to be known in the early 60s as the San Francisco Renaissance. So if you add to that the beats and the summer of love, and the various chemists, Sasha and others of the Bay Area, and all the people that they influenced. Um, if you look at the, I don't know, we'll call it new thought, motivational speaking, invitations to break out of the conventional, the ordinary, uh, sexual orientation, diversity, all manner of diversity and expression, all of this is happening in San Francisco. Uh, to a large degree in the world, it still is, now with a pronounced technology flavor. But given that so much consciousness bubbling has happened in San Francisco, finally at CIS, it's possible to be training people to become psychedelic guides. These are some of the people in the lineage of what is now CIS. Jumping ahead quite a few years, Robert Barnhart shows up. Why, Robert? I asked him a few days ago. The answer was like this. He had become what he would describe as an environmentalist, not something that he grew up with, but an awareness about the world and the interconnected, interconnected uh, things which came through the use of plants and chemicals, which he wanted to have influence his philanthropy. So the question for him is, where can I put some dollars where it will make a real difference given his own personal experience of consciousness change and change in relationship to the entire world. Well, he did some looking around and found out that there are these people named Stan Groff and Ralph Nixner, and guess where they were? Here in San Francisco, at CIS. So Robert came knocking, found Ralph, along about that time, Joe Biondo came on as president, and what emerged out of that is the Kransky Scholarship Fund, an endowed fund, to support student research around anything in theogenic, psychedelic, that uh, it, the committee would approve. I understand there have been about 30 of those awards so far of Kransky Scholarships, and here's just a sampling of them. I'll leave them on the screen just for a minute so you can scan the titles. So already from the year 2000, things psychedelic and things entheogenic have already been brought explicitly into an accredited institution, training psychotherapists and others. Then enter the picture, May Zhu and Bill Melton, who apparently in a car ride had an idea that, you know, if this front is moving as rapidly as we think it is, we should do something to help. I wonder if there could be a place to train therapists in this drive. 
Contact was made with Joe, contact was made with Janice, and with a whole lot of hard work, Janice, thank you so much. If you knew the times of day that people who are involved with this get emails from Janice, <laughs> from before dawn till way after night, it's due to that and the help of a lot of people that we have the CIIS, Center for Psychedelic Therapies and Research. There's kind of the incomplete, but especially in the back picture. So why is this happening now? You can tell your own story if you like. Um, something that crossed my inbox a couple weeks ago was a compendium of articles in the weekly magazine uh, Science News. And it was mostly around psychedelic drugs. A little bit about public policy, a little bit about other drugs or brain mechanisms, but mostly psychedelics. Mostly one or two lines per entry. It stretched out seven pages spanning the year 2005 through February of this year. That's how rapidly science is happening, how rapidly articles are appearing. Beyond science, groups are springing up. There are college groups, Psychedelic Society of San Francisco, Psychedelic Society of London. Uh, in New York City, there is now a new uh, psychedelic integration group, which is being hosted by the New School, something put together by Catherine McLean, who was part of the Hopkins research team. And I'm just going to read for you a list of some of the research institutions that are actually either now administering psychedelics or are deeply into the process of planning how they will do so. Uh, in other words, the serious people entering the work. <coughs> Johns Hopkins University, home team. <laughs> New York University, the University of Zurich, which is where the Hefter Research Center uh, is located in Zurich. The Autonomous University of Barcelona. Imperial College of London. The University of British Columbia. The University of Alabama at Birmingham. University of California, Los Angeles. That's Harvard, UCLA. University of California, San Francisco. Yay, home team again. <laughs> University of New Mexico. University of Wisconsin at Madison. Yale University. And I'm certain that I'm missing some. Why? Because new ones are coming into being all the time. <coughs> so it's, it can't be ignored. This has to be the right time for something like this certificate program to be happening. I'd like to offer something that may help the rest of the conversation tonight or may help even longer than that. <clears throat> Many years ago, a wonderful book was published called The Psychedelic Experience. Remember it? Mm -hmm. Very useful for people who didn't have a cultural background or a cartography for understanding profound experiences under large doses of, say, for example, LSD. But notice the title, The Psychedelic Experience it might lead you to think that there is one psychedelic experience. And everyone in this room knows that that's not so. But we don't always have it in mind when we talk to each other. So it's possible for person A to be talking about, oh, we're going to be doing psychedelic therapy. Person B hears it, and they're not actually connecting over what's really going on. The field has become so rich, it's been rich for a long time, but we would do well to be more explicit when we talk about spiritual work, psychedelic work, religious work in this realm. <clears throat> Here is a little typography. I'm sure that it's wrong. There may be fewer slices in the pie that make better sense, or maybe more slices in the pie would make better sense. But roughly speaking, we've got subthreshold doses. If you take it and you can feel it, it was not subthreshold. Moderate doses used for therapy, which can include introspection, and development of or access to feelings. Moderate doses typically can be used for philosophical uh, exploration and inquiry. Moderate doses can be used for creativity and problem solving. There's actually a literature from a couple decades ago, Willis Harbin, Jim Fadiman, and others did that work. And usually high doses can be used when the desire is to occasion non-dual experience. And it's complicated because non-dual experience has been found to have therapeutic value of its own. So it's all kind of tumbled up. I hope there can be forgiveness for what I'm about to do. The word psychedelic, because it's a single word, sometimes fails to capture all of this. And uh, being an engineer who did not study Latin or Greek, 
Uh, I'll just put these up and then very quickly take them away. <laughs> we might say that there are drugs called microdelics, or pheodelics, or musodelics, or dudelics, or gaudelics. <laughs> They're really that different. The experiences are that different. You could imagine a training program for each one of those independent things. And even what I said now is oversimplified. You take the cross product of that, and then you look at the classic hallucinogens, psilocybin, mescaline, LSD, and so on, the serotonergic ones. But then what about ketamine? And what about MDMA? And for those people who regard cannabis as a psychedelic, I'm not one of them, but some people do, what about cannabis? So we've got all of these categories crossed with all of the possible categories of substances, including ones we don't know about yet. So, good thing to keep in mind. There's another distinction that I very much like to offer, which is work, I'm using that instead of the word therapy, with the intention of treating a disorder, for example, a disorder in the DSM. But what happens if you go to a therapist or a counselor, they interview you, and at the end of 50 minutes or a couple of sessions, they say, you know, I can't really give you a DSM diagnosis. I think you're actually pretty healthy. You don't meet the criteria for kind of anything in this book. Does that mean the relationship ends? Often not. Often the client comes in because there's more work to be done. They want help exploring something or making sense of something or improving themselves in a certain way. So there's this dividing line between treating disorders on the one hand and what I've taken to calling the betterment of well people. <laughs> Even this is messier than it sounds. Why is it messy? Wellness is not a well-defined thing. <laughs> if you've got a broken arm, okay, that's not well. But the notion of how to be in culture, what one would feel like when you go to sleep in the morning or wake up in the morning, those are all culturally normed to a large degree. So what is well and what is unwell is actually a moving target. By the way, there was an exercise this afternoon amongst the cohort where we were asked to share wishes for the program. I have a wish for the program and a wish beyond that, which is the bar of what is considered to be normal or well goes up and up and up. It seems there's a lot of headroom. <laughs> so let's go back to this notion of reemergence instead of yet renaissance. And the question is, how do we get from one to the other without tripping? <laughs> By that I mean stumbling. <laughs> we could also have another conversation about how to get there without tripping, which you know, maybe 50 years from now, 100 years from now, these technologies will be considered a little bit archaic or just unnecessary or something done for sentimental reasons. <laughs> but let's not do it right now. <laughs> So again, this is a very complete list. Its purpose is to get you to think of more things and to help us all be cautious and to help us help other people be cautious. Here are some hazards along the way. I can tell you within the university research community, particularly the people who are looking to mount phase three studies of MDMA for treating PTSD, or psilocybin for treating end of life distress in cancer patients, which will be monumental achievements when they happen. One of the greatest fears is what the Food and Drug Administration calls a serious adverse event in a research volunteer, right? Imagine somebody, universe, this is not a request, somebody dies or has a severe psychiatric episode. It's gonna be, it's gonna be something. A lot of IRBs are going to wanna to take a second look at the risk-benefit ratio of doing the research. And it's not like this is happening at some music festival, right? This is supposed to be happening in settings that are designed for maximum safety, the best screening of volunteers, the best guidance, the best everything available. So within the research community, there's a hope that the phase three stuff gets done because lots of other things are gonna be happening. And at some point there might be a serious adverse event. Next item. For many of us, our training is not broad enough or deep enough. There aren't very many Bill Richards and Mary Cosimanos, et cetera, in the world. And one of the beauties, one of the great gifts of CIS at this point is offering a certificate program to significantly expand the number of people who hold that knowledge 
and or the capacity to share it or to use it, basically to propagate it. But in the meanwhile, there are not a lot of very deeply trained and experienced people working as guides. Uh, another item, I'm going to call it for people who are in the field, and when I say the field, I mean here not only healthcare, but also religion and spiritual matters. Uh, the occupational hazard is inflation, or grandiosity, or mania. And it might possibly be the case that those can be exacerbated by psychedelic experiences. Uh, I'm going to give you a somewhat obscured example outside of the domain of therapy. In December of last year, there crossed many of our screens a large flashy announcement of the first ever legal ayahuasca retreat center in the United States. There were a lot of words on a single web page. And you click through to another web page, and there's a lot of words. It takes a lot of scrolling to get to the bottom. One of the statements on the page was something along the lines of it is our plan to open 30 ayahuasca retreat centers in the 30 largest cities of the United States by 2023, which is our, forget the term, uh, our new golden age. So there was a lot of conversation on a lot of forums and private emails and whatnot about this. My personal best sense is the people doing it, probably very well intentioned. I actually don't think it was their intention to generate a, uh, a pyramid or a, basically a business model out of it. My best explanation is that these are people who had powerful experiences, felt nothing more than the world needs this and the United States needs it maybe at the top of the world, and it's their mission to go deliver it to a lot of people. By 2032, their new golden age. More about that later. For people who are using or being given psychedelics, <coughs> this is happening in other parts of the world legally, it's happening at music festivals here, at a later time in history, it may happen under expanded legal circumstances in the United States, but let's look at now. Very often, there's insufficient discernment about who really should be taking the materials. And often, the people who shouldn't be taking them are the last people to recognize that. And there's no one around them to say, hey, you might want to give that a second thought. Or you might want to ask someone. Or maybe you want to wait a few years. For people for whom it's not necessarily a bad idea, how about the development of intention? And how about the, the finding of an appropriate context of use? A few people are lucky enough and have the resources internally to be able to construct that, but many, many people can't. Uh, another item, insufficient support or holding, stronger world would be containment of powerful experiences. Go back to these ayahuasca retreat centers. Somebody has a powerful experience, it's good to get the counsel of friends. Um, it's old knowledge from the 60s. After a strong experience, don't get divorced, don't get married, don't quit your job. <laughs> Wait a while, talk to friends, see how it settles out. Um, saying kind of the same thing, but there's a notion in my mind of tempering through community. So this is not one-on-one, -on -one, hey, should I quit my job? It's more about developing, finding, or being in the context of a community of people where they're just norms. They're culturally held norms within your sub-community. It might be 20 people, it might be a couple hundred people, if you're lucky in certain parts of the world, it might be a small city. But uh, who here has read Aldous Huxley's book, Island? If you have it and you don't mind the language of the times, it's worth a read. Um, critics don't say it's his, it's his best book, but his wife, Laura, said it's his most important book. It's a great illustration of a culture that tempers experiences and almost renders the powerful experiences unnecessary because the culture is doing the psychedelic work without the psychedelics. Rick Tarnas used a, an interesting term. He talked about wild use. And by that, I think he means feral, like undomesticated. Anyone want to take a guess, according to government statistics, US statistics, how many people took a psychedelic for the first time in the last year? in the US, took a psychedelic for the first time, and initiated psychedelic use. 
know, like three percent. But people are saying a million are pretty much right on. It fluctuates year to year. Nine hundred thousand is dropped to less than half of that for a reason I won't go into. Speculated, it's gone up occasionally, but it's around a million. <laughs> and you know, in a way, it's amazing that we don't hear more sad stories from that. And at the same time, we also know that there are people who are having very traumatic experiences. And probably not many people to go to to make the best out of a traumatic experience. Something that we know from survey work at Johns Hopkins is that sometimes a challenging psychedelic experience can, at the end of it, still register as one of the most important, positive, spiritually meaningful occurrences of somebody's life. I think that of the 900,000 people who are having this kind of experience, more support would be helpful. <clears throat> Another hazard, backlash if, a, if psychedelics are associated with culture wars. Here's a way to transform society, here's a way to knock down the venture capitalists, here's a way to, you know, whatever. If it's associated too strongly with the cultural agenda, people on the other side of that, you know, even an opposite reaction, I kind of fear that, which is why I'm very happy that the focus now is on therapy. No one is going to have a big complaint if wonderful, highly significant therapies are available to treat PTSD or existential anxiety. So that's a very good thing to do. And probably most of us imagine that filtered out through the years, the decades, the generations, maybe the culture will shift. But my own personal take on that is pushing too hard is counterproductive. Things happen at their own pace. Let's see another hazard. Uh, there is this piece of legislation called the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, signed by Clinton in 1993. So far, there have been two entheogen-related cases that have been brought under the RFRA, as they say, RFRA. One was a landmark case with the Unaud Vegetal, decided 8-0 to zero in favor of the church, basically. It was followed by a case that did not need to go to the Supreme Court. So there are two now legal ayahuasca churches in the U.S. One of my fears is that some really bad cases are going to show up. And they'll lose, setting bad precedent, or they'll win, garnering a lot of press, or they'll be very noisy, garnering a lot of press. It's gonna, we're going to need that. Um, let's see, last out of many more candidates, commercialization. Can you think basically of anything in the United States that looks good that somebody doesn't try to package, commoditize, <laughs> multiply? franchise, pyramidize, sell, proselytize. Is there anything that's exempt from that? I would sure like for this to be one of them. I'm not sure how to do it. But for various reasons, if not such the hazard on the short road ahead, there would be something terribly sacrilegious in my mind about not approaching the substances and the experiences they can occasion as gifts to individuals and gifts to humanity. Again, a short list out of many possibilities, what can we do about it? One is for as many people as possible to get trained and to get well trained. Thank you again to Janice and to Joe and everyone who's made this day possible. Uh, thank you to many people in the room, uh, including Annie and others who are bringing wisdom about sitting with people into places where formal training is not possible, such as music festivals. So this gentle suffusion is happening, and the more the merrier. Another item that's always been true for me, it's come up this afternoon, is for us to be strengthening and growing the network that provides elder and peer review support. Who can you go to if you're not sure what to do with a client? Who can you go to if a client's having a hard time? Who can you go to if you're feeling uncertain about your own motivations? Who can you go to for what Quakers would call clearness? So that's what a support network is for. That's what elders are for. Let me give you an example of what peer slash elder support looked like in the case of this ayahuasca retreat. 30 centers, the 30 biggest cities, within a small number of years, huge long web pages about what we're doing and why we're doing it and our code of ethics and the splinter branch of the Native American church that we got a charter from, which makes the whole thing legal, by the way, I don't think that's true. Anyhow, on and on. 
What happened? A number of experts in the field, anthropologists, uh, people who know the ayahuasca world, conferred by email, and very rapidly wrote to the organizers of this retreat saying, y'all are making a really big mistake. This actually isn't legal. Even if you did have a charter from an authorized branch of the Native American church, the Native American church does not enjoy an exemption from all the drug laws. They get to use peyote in traditional Native American services only. They don't get to use ayahuasca. There's one piece of commentary that I found on YouTube. It's about 24 minutes long um, by a youngish man who apparently was part of this retreat center at the start and for various reasons dropped out. And it just about brought tears to my eyes because he was actually very gentle in his criticism. It almost wasn't criticism. So I was involved with this group. Here's what I saw in the individuals. They mean well. They want to bring a great gift. Many of us think they're going about it in ways that aren't exactly wholesome or prudent for this point in time. Um, and he ended with, with four points, which he titled The Heart of the Matter. And again, this was directed to the people who want to build 30 retreat centers. One is lack of elders. Two is lack of indigenous representation. Three is excessive retreat, uh, retreat costs, which amounts to exclusiv uh, exclusivity if you can't afford it. <clears throat> and the last was a lack of consensus in the medicine community. And it had an effect. The website was taken down for a couple of days with a little banner saying, whoops, we're looking into things. And it came back. I don't know what the state is. But what I appreciate about this is that here are people who know something, who are peers or elders, who did not wait to be asked. So as we develop networks of support for each other, what I would encourage you know, I'll, I'll just do it now. One is, I will offer help and counsel to you when I see there's need to. In other words, I will lean in a little bit. You can tell me to stop. I'll try to be sensitive. But if I see a need for something to be said, I'm going to say it. The flip coin of that is, <clears throat> I invite you, almost implore you, that if you see me doing something or not doing something and you feel as though I'm kind of a little off course in one way, please come to me. And what I hope will be true is that even if it's uncomfortable, I will thank you. So the more of that that goes on, the better. It's very easy for me to get caught up in this new paper is about to be published, or we just got approval to do this incredibly wonderful study, or I'm involved in a training program for guides, and it'll be over in nine months, and I'll complete the training. And these are all you know, incremental, wonderful milestones to be celebrated, and we all have them in our own way. There's also something to be said for allowing oneself to imagine a very long arc to think not to five years from now, 10 years from now, but how about 50 years from now? How about like the era of your grandkids, if you have or will have grandkids? There are so many things that, in my view, work better when playing a very long game. And sometimes that means making short-term sacrifices for the long-term game. So that's for each of us to decide. Some people are called to act here and now, and there's something right in front of us, and to almost put on blinders, and sometimes that's the right thing to do. If somebody's suffering right now, let's help them. And others of us at other times may see that in a very much larger <coughs> picture. So I just want to encourage us to have that larger picture available as a point of view also. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you for being here. I'm um, going to ask Tannis. Oh, Tannis just left. Ah, Tannis, we need you. I'm done. <laughs>